afternoon and welcome to Chats with Jamie. I'm Jamie Franklin, curator at the Bennington Museum, and we're just so pleased to be able to bring to you these chats um, with various local artists that we have in the last few weeks. But today I'm excited to bring um, Ellery Fouch, who is an assistant professor um, of American Studies at Middlebury College, um, to chat about what I think is a really fascinating historical object um, that I think has some pertinence to today's um, time. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Ellery. Hi, Jamie. It's great to see Hi. you. <laughs> it's great to see you as well. Um, so I, you published an article on what is referred to as a glass ballot box back in 2016, um, um, uh, uh, which was the time of the last presidential election cycle. And of course, again, we're in another um, presidential election year. And um, in, in fact, you were the last person that I had lunch with pre-pandemic. So, and you mentioned that you were working on this project again. And so it was in the back of my mind and I thought I'd been wanting to chat with you or, or present um, this research that you've done into the ballot box because it has local ties here to North Bennington. So um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what the glass ballot box is and the kind of historical context um, and so why don't we bring up that first slide so people can see what we're talking about and you can give us a little bit of background on it. Great. Yeah, it's such a treat to see it um, and to get to learn more about its Bennington connections. Um, so the glass ballot box was designed and patented in the 1850s in response to a lot of concerns about uh, election fraud and vote tampering, election tampering, um, concerns about corruption in politics. Uh, it was a very, very tense time across the nation, but especially in uh, San Francisco and New York were two cities that were experiencing a lot of uh, disruption, political corruption, distrust of the media, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments. Some of this might sound familiar to our own historical context, um, but in response to concerns about election rigging, um, this box was designed to show um, voters and bystanders all of the ballots as they were put into the box. Um, in 1856 in San Francisco, um, there had been a, a lot of troubles, but one of the things they discovered after an election was what was called a stuffer's ballot box. A wooden ballot box that had hidden panels in which they um, the electrode electioneering officials had hidden pre-marked ballots, um, thus skewing the results of the election. And so Samuel Jolly, who was actually a music publisher in New York, uh, came forward with this invention that would show all the ballots as they went in, um, as they were being counted. And he thought that this kind of literal transparency of the process could reassure people about the sanctity and they kept referring to the purity of elections, which I think is really interesting terminology too. So I, I, this is um, happening in the in the mid to late 1850s, um, and I think the, the the glass ballot box as an object and as an idea continued on um, into the era of the Civil War in the 1860s. Do you know what were the kind of political um, um, issues that were that issues of kind of um, transparency or lack thereof were being um, that brought about the, the desire or the feeling of need for transparency that, the, that this ballot box embodies? In many cases, it was this very literal concern about the accuracy of elections or concerns about um, the Tammany Ring, for example, in New York and the power that it would uh, use to kind of sway election results or um, implement cronyism, uh, giving jobs to political supporters and uh, taking away the power of others. So the, the ballot box became also this emblem for any kind of concern about the will of the people, for example. Um, it became this emblem that could embody uh, the voice of the people, the vote, and then its kind of image got used in a lot of political illustrations, which we might talk about in a little bit. Um, but much of it was very much about the material properties of glass as something that 
um, can't have any concealment that would exhibit all of the ballots cast. And so you could constantly, through this, these metaphors of supervision and surveillance, um, have a sense that you were getting a accurate sense of the actual vote and will of the people, which of course in this period was limited to white men. Um, so that's an important point to note as well. The ballot yeah. box as an emblem does get used later on in political uh, cartoons and illustrations, both for and against expanding suffrage to um, black voters, to American Indians, and later to women. That's great. And um, so you, you mentioned that it, these kind of political issues that kind of um, resulted in the, the invention of, of this ballot box um, came out of New York and San Francisco. But as I said earlier, um, there is a local tie. So why don't we bring up the next slide um, and tell us a little bit about um, how this glass ballot box um, has connections to right here in, in North Bennington in particular. Yeah, so in my research into the ballot box, I was trying to figure out how many communities used it and uh, kind of where where one could find it if it circulated beyond New York. Um, and in searching through historical newspapers, I came across this announcement uh, for a consignment of the Jolly glass ballot boxes. Um, and there were other glass ballot boxes at the time, but we can tell this is the specific Jolly one because it talks about this globular form. Uh, enclosed in an iron frame secured to the tables. Um, by reason of their transparent quality, they're incapable of fraud and would detect any fraudulent ballots that might be cast. Um, but as you can see here at the bottom, any order sent to TW Park, San Francisco, accompanied by the money will be promptly attended to. And so looking into this, I realized that this was Trainer Park of the Park McCullough House in Bennington. Um, and so this was, he was part of the so-called vigilance committee that was working against corruption in San Francisco. Um, and so this was during his California years. And I think you probably know more about Trainer Park than I do. <laughs> yeah, so, so Trainer Park um, um, has deep ties to Bennington and, and to North Bennington. And he actually went out to California um, shortly after the gold rush um, in, in the late 1840s and early 1850s and made his um, um, fortune, um, which ended up being the money that helped to build um, the Park McCullough House, um, which is still a, a beautiful um, um, home that still stands um, with much of its furnishings intact um, in North Bennington. Um, and but he was in San Francisco during this period working, I believe, as a lawyer and also um, kind of speculating in real estate. Of course, um, during this period, a lot of money could be made in both of those um, particular professions um, in San Francisco. And so so though deep ties here and he came back here eventually um, during this period, um, he was in San Francisco. And so it makes sense that um, he would um, have had some connections with um, the ballot box um, being there in San Francisco during this period. So that's one of the reasons why I got really excited when I read your article is to just um, think about the wider connections in the world. Um, and then, um, you know, you mentioned earlier the um, political cartoons and the way in which these ba glass ballot boxes kind of became visual emblems of um, kind of democracy and transparency in elections. And so why don't we bring up this next image, um, which is a political cartoon um, um, connected um, here in Vermont. Um, I don't know exactly what the context of this is. Do, can you, do you know anything about the context of this cartoon? So I can share a little bit about this. Um, Harper's Weekly Cartoon by Thomas Nast that I believe was from the 1860s. Um, and the concerns during the Reconstruction era about um, Southerners resisting Reconstruction and both uh, conducting voter suppression, uh, keeping Black voters who were newly enfranchised from the poll, often using really violent tactics of um, intimidation and brutality. Um, but also in terms, if you can see the sphere here, rather than being a transparent 
it says solid fraud. And there's actually a, like a dollar sign for the S. And so there was this kind of tension about whether the ballot box was still able to be this transparent recorder of the will of the people, or if it was in fact, rather than transparent, solid, and uh, kind of with the, the cards stacked against it. I think in this particular cartoon, they're speaking to the ways in which uh, Vermont's more progressive values might elect the Republican Party in this era. And of course, that 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 sounds strange to us today, but right. um, the, the Republicans <laughs> at, uh, of the eighteen sixties um, were, were much different than than um, um, the Republicans. And though though Vermont interestingly had a um, hundred plus year um, um, period in which um, we were voted solely for Republicans, so. Um, and that is an important part of our history. It's, it's a really fascinating image and it, it's great to be able to connect these issues. Like you said, so much of this, the issues surrounding these ballot boxes feel so valid today. And so why don't we actually go back to just um, the two of us chatting and as we close out this conversation, um, I mentioned earlier that when we had lunch back in the beginning of March, you, you mentioned that you're working on this project again. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, what you've been working on um, um, lately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I was so excited to stumble across the ballot box in 2016 or 2014 maybe. And I was really surprised that I hadn't, there didn't seem to be a lot of scholarship about it or much, much research into it. Um, and so in the course of working on the article, I was even more excited to find all of this, um, kind of supplemental, material and representations of it. And it just, the political situations of division, concerns about corruption and election interference seem to just become more and more relevant um, over, over time. Um, and even today there are debates now about whether we will be able to vote by mail, whether that kind of return to paper balloting um, would be possible. So I contacted colleagues at the Corning Museum of Glass to see if they would be interested in um, sharing this work with a broader, with a broader public. Um, and so I've continued to collect uh, examples of political cartoons that include the box. Um, and I found a lot of really fun uh, kind of descendants of the box, like this bank um, that was patented, clearly also evoking this kind of slippage between voting and with ballots and voting with money, the place of money in politics, I think is really interesting. Um, so yeah, and actually just now when, when the Trainer Park clipping was big on the screen, I realized it said that he was charging $40 per box, but Samuel Jolly charged $15 a box to the New York State legislators. And so, I don't know, the more time I spend with it, the more kind of discrepancies and potential evidence of corruption, <laughs> um, even in the box itself come out or profiteering from it. Well, that's great. I'm so glad that we were able to just um, connect digitally as it may be and, and share a little bit about your research um, with our folks um, at the museum and supporting the museum, um, largely through our digital programming these days because of the closure. I'm sure because of all the uncertainty, you may not know exactly when um, um, any project may open at the Corning Museum or are there any dates um, out there or is it kind of um, still uncertain? It's kind of up in the air. We had hoped that it would open in September and there were great plans to have the League of Women Voters there registering people to vote. Um, it seems like that likely won't happen. I, I don't think they've reached a decision about what they're opening will be or what that will look like. Um, so it might become more of a virtual digital kind of experience as well. Well, I, I encourage people to, um, if they have a chance, um, you know, Corning, um, it's a bit of a drive, but um, I've been out there. It's an absolutely incredible museum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully museums will start to reopen, um, you know, with, you know, their visitors and staff safeties in mind. The museum is going to be, Bennington Museum will be reopening on July 3rd. And so hopefully we can um, all start to get back to 
um, I don't want to say sense of normalcy, but at least start to get back to um, um, doing and seeing some of the things that mean so much to Amash, like, you know, our material, culture, and history, the things that we're talking about, because they do matter today. Um, and they help us understand, you know, the really serious issues that we're dealing with today. And looking back can sometimes help us move forward. So thank you, Ellery. Um, and I hope you're well. And um, see you again sometime soon, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Likewise.